figured this is probably the last week that I'm actually able to post anything autumn themed and I have some autumn themed footage from the past couple of weeks always intended for another vlog that I have been way too lazy to start. Uh, so this is just gonna be a little bit of a weekend reading vlog. Uh, November has gone off the rails for me as October did and so essentially I have not stayed to any of my nonfiction November plans. I knew that was coming uh, because this is also NaNoWriMo so this is National Novel Writing Month and I have been really really focused on finishing the first draft of my Italian Renaissance set historical fantasy and I am very close to the end. I've written basically 20,000 words this month which was my ultimate goal. So I am really really excited about it that I am so near to the end and I think I'm going to consider it wrapped up when I reach around the 70,000 word mark because even though I know there are some scenes that are rough and that definitely need more added to them, I don't want to start rereading things and then get sucked into the void uh, in terms of editing because I know that will happen. I have always been somebody who edited as I went, which I know is terrible. It's not what you're supposed to do. But unfortunately, the thing is, is that when my brain is in writing mode, it's not really in reading mode because I think writing and reading both appeal to the same sides of my brain, if you know what I'm saying. And so when I've had like a really good writing session or even a bad writing session and it felt like work, I always feel like, well, I've tapped into that. You know, I did my reading for the day because technically it's kind of the same creative process to me in a weird way. So quite unusually for me, I am in the middle of at least four things right now. In terms of nonfiction November reading, I have been reading Svetlana Alexievich's Secondhand Time, which is an oral history of the fall of communism and how the USSR dissolved. Uh, but it spans the years from 1990 to about 2010, so she goes very far afterwards. And she has a lot of various interviews with people at different levels of society, people who live in different places, and different perspectives on the same events. This is an absolutely fascinating read. It's going to get five stars from me. I first heard about this from Jill over at The Book Bully, and I'll link to her channel down below. I love her channel, and she's read a lot of Cold War um, and Russian history, and she highly recommended this, and I can definitely see why. It's not an easy read. Uh, you might can imagine some people's stories are very, very difficult to read, but it's so episodic that it makes it really easy to read a chapter here and sit the book down and read something else for a while. I'm about halfway through. To say I'm enjoying it is probably not the right word. I think it's very interesting, but it's also incredibly tragic. And one of the main kind of through lines of this book so far has been from like nearly every person they say, if you did not live this, if you did not live as a Soviet, you cannot possibly understand it and you can't understand people's nostalgia for that time period because it's a way of life that you literally cannot understand unless you lived it. And I think that's, I mean, really fascinating. Uh, so I am interested to read more of Svetlana Alexievich's work because apparently she has tons of oral history on a bunch of different periods of Russian and Soviet history. I'm also currently in the middle of European Travel for the Monstrous Gentlewoman by Theodora Goss. Last week, I blew through the first book in this series of The Strange Case of the Alchemist Daughter and... I just was obsessed with it. This one has not been nearly as good, but the setup for this is this is a historical fantasy basically with the daughter of nearly every Victorian monster that you know of. So mainly it follows the daughter of Dr. Jekyll. There is the daughter of Mr. Hyde. There is a Frankenstein figure. There is Rappuccini's daughter, and there is somebody from the island of Dr. Moreau. Sherlock Holmes is also in this. I mean, there's a lot of crossover with other works, but I just really love it. I think this is a wonderful group of female characters, and I think it really analyzes why women have such a place in horror history. Because though most of these women are fictional characters, you know, kind of attributed daughters to these more famous men, uh, 
there was always kind of a female experimentation aspect to nearly all of these classic horror books. And so Theodore Goss has gone with this kind of interpretation of it, of them all having daughters, of the daughters banding together, of women saving women from other experimentation. And it's been really, really wonderful. The first book was far more of a mystery setup, which I loved. Um, and this one has not been as good because it's literally twice the length of the first book and it doesn't need to be it does not need to be the first book is a little bit more of a mystery setup kind of almost a jack the ripper-esque uh style killer this one is kind of following up on easter eggs that were placed in the first one with a couple of other different characters i did buy the third and final book in this trilogy and i was going to kind of burn through them right in a row but I think I need to take a break after this one because this has just genuinely needed a lot of editing in my opinion and it's been a very weird read because it'll often start in the middle of the action and then go back and tell you how they got there and that's happened four or five times at this point halfway through over halfway through and I don't really like that as a narrative style I think once or twice it works and it makes things interesting I think more than once I'm thinking why didn't the editor catch this you know, and there's been a lot of repetition of things. Again, not just the once or twice that it would be really helpful, but maybe four or five times I've heard the same thing over again. We're going to do this. We're going to do it like this. We're going to do this. We're going to do it like this. And it's like, okay, I get it. My memory is not that bad. This is just a really wonderful group of characters and I kind of feel like I would read about them doing anything but I don't want to read about them doing the same things over and over again if that makes any sense but if you're a big fan of Victorian literature or classic horror in general you should pick this book up because it's very League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or um, Van Helsing, the movie with Hugh Jackman. And that genre kind of blending of multiple characters from different stories together I love it. It's something that I really, really enjoy. And I love it this time of year. It's a very, very atmospheric series. And I'm going to say something controversial, yet brave. I like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in this series far more than I have ever liked them before. I think Theodore Goss has actually written a Sherlock Holmes that I can like. Uh, last but not least, I have been reading The Eternal City, A History of Rome in Maps by Jessica Meyer. I requested this from the University of Chicago Press, and I cannot believe that they sent this to me. It's so beautiful. It is so beautiful. It's got some stunning artwork. The maps are absolutely wonderful. The pictures of the city are really wonderful. This map is one of my favorites from the 1490s, and it's actually of real value to me right now with my work in progress for NaNoWriMo. This is absolutely the perfect map. I absolutely needed this map two or three weeks ago. But the images are absolutely beautiful, and it's talking about not only how the maps show how Rome has changed over the centuries, but it also kind of says why these maps were created and why they function in the way that they do, like medieval maps. There are very many medieval maps of Rome, but they were typically drawn from a long distance away. They were typically done by monks who lived in England or in France or in another part of Italy who had never been to the city before. And so they're kind of talking about Rome in a more spiritual way as kind of the homeland of St. Peter or as a religious center. And so they talk about it a little bit more allegorically than they do physically. And so the maps from the medieval period are not accurate at all physically to what the city was. Uh, so there's been a lot of really interesting information here and it's been genuinely helpful for me in terms of research. It's just absolutely beautiful and I can't believe how big it is, how wonderful the illustrations and images are. It's just absolutely stunning. I have no doubt I will finish The Eternal City this weekend. I have no doubt I will finish Theodora Goss's book. Uh, and when I finish that, I am planning to move on to These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong because I cannot wait for that book. That is a Romeo and Juliet retelling set in Shanghai in 1926. And I just said, you know, I need that in my life. I need to read a Romeo and Juliet retelling. I've recently ordered a couple of things from thrift books and I don't know when they're gonna be here, but I got another Shakespeare retelling called Phallus Fair. And it's like a Macbeth retelling that's set 
in a boarding school, but it mostly focuses on Lady Macbeth rather than Macbeth. And I am genuinely fascinated by that. Macbeth is not my favorite Shakespeare play, but I just think that's going to be a really, really interesting read when that gets here. I did get my hair cut today. Finally got some self-care done. It really, it really, really needed to be cut. I mean, honestly, half of it was dead. My hair was down to my waist. I know y'all couldn't see it, but it was literally down to my waist in the back. So I am really happy to see some curl back in my hair. Uh, so I have some fun things planned for this weekend. I am mostly gonna go on and get ready for Christmas. I know it's a little bit early to some people, a little bit late to others, but I am ready for Christmas and I'm ready to feel in the spirit. 2020 has been a hard year for a lot of people and mentally I think it's taken its toll on everybody and we just need some of the Christmas spirit. Uh, so it's Friday right now. I am going to watch The Great British Bake Off and I am going to watch The Mandalorian and I am really, really going to enjoy myself. But in honor of my book being so close to finished. I am going to be having some asparagus garlic pasta tonight. In the morning, I am having panettone. And if you have never had panettone, I implore you, go out and get one right now. They come in a nice little red box. It's a really, really soft, sweet bread filled with um, dried fruit, typically dried orange peel or raisins or um, dried cranberries. So, so good, and it's so soft, it's really spongy. It's an Italian uh, specialty this time of year, and I love it. Kind of wish I had never eaten it before because it is an absolute addiction. But I'm gonna go on and start celebrating early and have some asparagus pasta tonight while I watch The Mandalorian and The Great British Bake Off. Well, good afternoon. It is Saturday afternoon uh, and a little Christmas decorating has occurred, so I will show it to you. So we have a little shelf done up in a different room than the den. Normally, we don't necessarily decorate other parts of the house than the room where the tree is or the kitchen. But this year, anyway, it felt kind of pertinent to me to have some spirit in the rest of the house. And so this is just going to be in another place where we spend a lot of time, especially since I've been working from home partially. This is a room that I'm in a lot. So it's kind of nice to have something that seems a little bit festive, but can also transition into the winter. And I was also really bad. And I went to Barnes and Noble, as I'm sure you saw in that clip. And there was like literally no one there. So I didn't feel bad about going in terms of social distancing. But I felt bad for them because, you know, to be a weekend 
there just is like nobody there. Uh, so I did pick up a few things because I was at Barnes and Noble. The first thing I picked up is A Queen in Hiding by Sarah Kozloff. And I picked this up basically because I heard Olive from a book Olive rave about this series a few months ago. Really interestingly, all four books in this series were published month by month earlier this year, which is really unique in terms of publishing. But her review made me feel like this is a fantasy series that I could probably really like. Uh, it's apparently female-led, female-driven, and all about a monarchy of queens. Uh, so I think I'm really going to enjoy this. I also picked up The Romanoff Sisters by Helen Rappaport. And in the past, I feel sure that I have read something by Helen Rappaport before. I know she has a book that is essentially about the deaths of the Romanovs out at Yekaterinburg. And I do believe I have read that at least in part because I took a Russian history course, Russian 20th century course when I was an undergrad. And I do believe we read part of that for that class which is interesting. I don't know of another time that I really read a so-called popular historian in an actual history course, but I do believe we read part of her book on that. So this is her book on the Romanov sisters, and apparently it is not going to delve into the last months of their lives at all because she has previously written a book focusing on that period of time. Uh, so I am really interested in this. The Romanovs and the Russian Revolution is a pet period for me. It is something that I really enjoy reading and studying about, but I do not feel qualified in any way, shape, or form to tell people where to start with it or anything about it because... It's not one of my strongest areas. It's just a period that really fascinates me. Uh, so I am very much looking forward to this. I was thinking about picking it up this month in honor of Nonfiction November, and that might still happen. I also picked up Things in Jars by Jess Kidd, and this was basically a cover buy. I did see that it is historical fiction set in Victorian London, and it's about solving a mystery. I'm not sure if it's a kidnapping or if it's a murder, but after reading uh, The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter and then the second book in that series, which I did finish last night, I'll tell you about that. After reading those, I just felt like I was a little bit in the mood for a Victorian historical fiction, a Victorian mystery. And this is apparently very acclaimed, even though it's rather short. So I'm interested to see how I feel about this. I've never heard anything about it, even though supposedly it is an incredibly acclaimed book from the past couple of years. So I just, I'm apprehensive about it because I do think it'll probably skew a little bit literary. But every now and again, I go into a Barnes & Noble and I just take a chance on a book that I've never heard anything about. And I typically have a very good time with those books. Last year, I did it with uh, The Lovely War, which was an absolutely fantastic historical fiction book about World War I and World War II that I highly recommend. And so I've had a pretty good experience doing that in the past, just trusting my instincts. So hopefully, I've made pretty good choices here. I also picked up The Tower of Fools by Andrzej Sapkowski. And Andrzej Sapkowski is the author of The Witcher series. And this is a series that apparently came out in Poland, gosh, almost 20 years ago now. But it's just now being published and translated into English. But it is a historical fantasy set in the 1400s in Poland. And I just have the sense that I'm really going to enjoy it. I loved Andrzej Sapkowski's writing style when I read The Last Wish last year. And for some odd reason, I have just never carried on with the Witcher series. I really was not enamored by the show, to be frank. I did not like how they jumped back and forth between these timelines. And I felt like if I had read the books, I would have been in a better place. But I was a little bit lost. I was glad I'd read the first book because I did at least have that groundwork. But the show kind of lost me a little bit. And now I'm not quite sure because of the show whether I'm going to enjoy the rest of the books in the Witcher series, which I think is probably ridiculous. I probably really would love the rest in the Witcher series because I do love a Slavic or Polish set fantasy. And so I think this is going to scratch that itch for me. I'm really into historical fantasies right now especially this month because it's NaNoWriMo. I'm so close to the end of the draft of my historical fantasy. So I just feel myself being really pulled to kind of similar things, even though I doubt this would be similar at all. But historical fantasy 
feels like a very small genre in the fantasy genre as a whole. So I'm interested to see how other people tackle it and what elements they put into their historical fantasy. Uh, so I finished European travel for the monstrous gentlewoman uh, last night and all of my suspicions about it were confirmed. No, it absolutely did not need to be this length. It is literally twice the length of the first or the third book. Uh, and like things happened and definitely things that needed some page count to be explored. And I think on the whole, I have to say that in general, something happened in every chapter, but it just felt to me a little bit like we were consistently retreading old ground and constantly doing similar things over and over again. So I just genuinely think the book could have been half this size. And so now I'm apprehensive about the third book. I absolutely loved the first book. This book is probably sitting maybe at a three stars, maybe at like a 2.5 for me. And so now I'm apprehensive with how the series is going to wrap up. I think I will take a break from it just to give it a real chance. I know right now I'm not in the mood to continue on with it, so I'm not going to force myself to. Uh, but I think I might pick up These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong this afternoon. But I think I'm also going to try to get in some writing today because the weekend is really the time that I can get it done. But since we're trying to get decorated for Christmas, I don't know how much we'll get done. That's really why I wanna push through and finish the draft so I can really enjoy the Christmas season. But that's my update for right now. Hopefully I will continue on with some Christmas decorations and maybe some reading and writing will get done this afternoon. Good Monday morning. Uh, there's my kettle, it's getting going. I need a cup of tea on a Monday morning. Uh, I did start These Violent Delights yesterday. I didn't get very far, but it's really, really good so far. Really well written. Um, I will check in with you probably after work. I don't think I'll get to read anything, even on my lunch hour today. Mondays are typically pretty busy days for me, um, and sometimes at lunch all I need to do is gel and watch booktube, so I'll check in with you later. So, it is Monday evening. And as I suspected, I didn't get any reading done at lunch, but that's totally fine. Uh, I might get some reading done tonight. So Thursday is Thanksgiving. It's going to be a rather laid back affair for us this year, but it's just gonna be me and my mom and an aunt who is basically part of our bubble. And we're not doing anything traditional. We're actually gonna be eating fish. We're actually gonna be eating shellfish mostly having shrimp, scallops, and I think we will have some flounder. Thanksgiving is going to be very different this year because we're not going with any traditional foods. We, the three of us, don't typically care for them. Uh, so I think the fish is going to be really exciting and I'm probably going to enjoy it 10 times more than I do a typical Thanksgiving. I know, I should get my Southerner card revoked for that, for saying that, that I don't care much for Thanksgiving food, but alas, it is the truth. These Violent Delights is absolutely incredible so far. I am not totally sure how I missed this in the synopsis, but there's actually a kind of a supernatural element to this. There is a monster plaguing Shanghai. Uh, and so I have totally missed that in everything I've heard about it thus far. And so that's a really exciting element to the story for me. And I also typically don't like this, but they have had a relationship previously that ended badly. Uh, and so now they're being forced to work together to solve uh, the crimes of these monsters. And I'm actually really enjoying it. I hate, hate, hate anything labeled like a second chance romance or somebody getting back together because to me, I don't really care about people getting together. I care about the lead up to the relationship. And so for me, in most of these cases, that's been robbed. Coming back together is like playing on history and everything that we as the reader did not experience with those characters. So I typically struggle with that. But so far for me, These Violent Delights has not fallen into that pitfall yet. But I'm looking forward to reading more of that tonight. I was going to continue on with the Christmas decorations. We still have some fall stuff in here in the den. That's typically where the Christmas tree goes. But I have my new bookshelf. It doesn't feel so new anymore because I've had it since March. Uh, but that literally feels like 10 years ago. But that is actually where we typically move this tree. 
And so now we are searching for how we are going to reorient this room so that the Christmas tree can be in its typical place because there is literally nowhere else that Christmas tree can go. Uh, so we have a lot of reconfiguring to do here, uh, but I'm hopeful that we can continue to put up more Christmas stuff and maybe have some things done before Thanksgiving. Of course, Thanksgiving and Black Friday, as a matter of fact, are going to be absolutely nothing like they normally are. They're not going to be long, drawn-out, day-long affairs. Black Friday can now be a really laid-back day where we put up the Christmas ornaments and the Christmas tree, and it doesn't have to feel like something that all has to get done on one day, which is kind of how it feels in typical years, that you go out, you shop, you've had a long day on Thanksgiving, and then you have to go buy your tree or put up your artificial tree at the end of that day or that weekend. And so the weekend itself is is actually not rejuvenating. It's not a relaxing holiday weekend at all because you've had so much to do. And I'm hoping this year that it will be different because everything is gonna be forced to be kind of laid back, but we shall see. So I am looking forward to breaking tradition this year and enjoying some fish. I will probably check in with you tomorrow. Hopefully I will have gotten some more reading done. Good morning. It is Thursday, Thanksgiving morning. Uh, so I decided I would go on and wrap this vlog up so that I have a video to post tomorrow uh, because I have been very much off the grid in terms of booktube the past few weeks and really essentially this month after um, October and I was posting so much, posting multiple videos a week, I really, really got tired of filming. I got really burnt out and so I think I really just needed a good digital detox. I needed some time away from filming and just away from being online and I'm very glad that I have taken that break. I think that's a really good thing. Now I'll be back in full force hopefully for December because I really love filming in December every year because I just really love filming around the Christmas stuff. Uh, so as you saw, step one of the tree is done. The tree is up. Uh, some red balls are on it which are the first step. Uh, so step one is done. Step two, the actual decoration can take place tomorrow. So we did put the tree in the place that it always typically goes. And if you've been around on my channel, you probably know I film with my tree every year. Uh, and so it's still in the same exact place that it was. But that means that we had to move everything that was in that corner, which is another artificial tree and a big chair. And the big chair now blocks where I typically film, my typical filming setup. It blocks that whole bookshelf. So hopefully I don't decide that I need any books off of that shelf in the coming month. So unfortunately, I'm a little bit at a loss for how I'm going to film moving forward. I thought I would wrap up my reading week here uh, because it is, it's about 11 o'clock in the morning right now. We're not going to Thanksgiving dinner until around four. We are having fish tonight, which is not a very traditional American Thanksgiving, um, but it's probably actually more of a historically accurate Thanksgiving dinner. You know, when you think about it, think about the first Thanksgiving. What do you think they were eating? They were not eating sweet potato casserole. I can tell you that. They were probably eating fish. I know they ate venison. And I think really fascinatingly that they ate lobster. And lobster itself has a very interesting history here in the States in that it started out as like a very poor person's food because lobsters are bottom feeders. And then it's progressed into being this really luxurious food item. But like I said, the three of us are not big on the typical, the stereotypical um, Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, I think we are really going to enjoy this. I did make my cranberry sauce though. I make cranberry sauce every year. But so let's wrap up the week of reading. Uh, I did finish Rome, The Eternal City. Yeah, The Eternal City, A History of Rome in Maps by Jessica Mayer, which was sent to me by the University of Chicago Press. And I am so thankful to them for this because this book is absolutely 
incredible. This was a five star read. I expected to like this because I expected the illustrations and the art pieces to be really, really beautiful. And they so were. The interesting thing is, and this book will tell you this, is that Rome, to be the eternal city, has certainly gone through a lot of changes across the centuries. It's really evolved. And so since the city has really evolved, there are pieces of kind of the ancient city that were gone for centuries, that were buried under sediment. And so I'm constantly trying to contextualize what characters or what people would have seen in the 1490s versus what you would see today. Today there has been a lot of excavation done and of course you can visit uh, the Roman Forum. You could always visit the Roman Forum. The Roman Forum has just gone through a lot. It, basically in the medieval period and almost until a couple of centuries ago, so basically almost up into the modern day, the Forum was used as kind of a cattle grazing land and so, is that not fascinating? Just think, you're going to wander among all of these ancient ruins, and there's just cows grazing, eating on grass. I just love it. I actually love the image of that. She does go into detail about things like that, things that were maybe really obvious in the ancient city uh, that have certainly been lost to us. They had a really wonderful map of Rome uh, in the empire that has unfortunately been lost. It was probably in Trajan's library. And Trajan's Forum is across the street from the Imperial Forum. And that was not seen for a very long time. That lay buried for a very, very long time. So Rome has been through a lot of really interesting changes and the ruins have been adapted into living spaces many, many times. Uh, people lived in the Colosseum, I think in the year 1000, the Colosseum was actually an apartment building, which is utterly fascinating to me. People lived in the stands of the Colosseum. So I just found this book really fascinating because it really explored that and it also explored why certain maps were drawn in certain ways. It's certainly interesting how maps of Rome have progressed across the centuries and how the city itself has continued to develop and grow, how things have changed, how modern buildings have adapted to being around uh, the ruins how the ruins in some cases were completely forgotten about for centuries or there were rumors that certain ruins were used for certain things, which was not true. So I'm not only interested in how they got things wrong, why they got things wrong, but kind of how we knew those things were wrong, how we came back and corrected those inaccuracies I just think that's really fascinating. Rome is a really interesting city to do this with because it's been through a lot and so much from its ancient period has survived. So there's certainly a lot to kind of grasp onto. This is just a really fascinating, fabulous book. I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, and it's a beautiful coffee table book. And like I said, the illustrations are just stunning. I think if you love Rome, it's definitely a book to get. But speaking of this and thinking a little bit about my writing project, I hit 70,000 words last night. So this has been a really eventful week for me. I'm not done. I said I would allow myself to call it done when I reached 70,000 words, but the last part of the book has not been written yet, so I feel really good. I've been worried this whole time that I was underwriting it, uh, and so now that I'm at 70,000 words, I feel a little bit better about knowing that I'm going to have to cut some things and add some things in. I don't feel like the book is going to be too short, and I definitely don't feel like it's going to be too long, but 70,000 words is an incredible achievement to me. Uh, so I'm definitely, I'm definitely hopeful that I can get this draft done by the end of the year. And that was my main goal for 2020 was to say that I finished a draft of my book. And I think I'm gonna be able to say that. And that's really, really, really exciting. Uh, so then I'm still reading These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong. I am maybe, yeah, I'm not really halfway through yet, but I am thoroughly enjoying this. And I really just think that her writing is exquisite. I don't think it strays into the realm of purple prosy, which is kind of my sweet spot. I do love a purple prose. I love to be amazed by writing style. And there are elements here that really do that for me. And when I first picked this up, I was feeling like really great about my own writing project. And then I started reading the prologue to this and I was like, why am I even trying to write? <laughs> it's never going to be like this. And then I said, no, I'm not going to compare a finished product 
to a first draft. I'm not going to do it. So in a way, this has been motivational to me. But I just think her writing is really technically proficient because I can instantly visualize what the characters are doing. When she says that they move a certain way or that they hold a weapon a certain way or that they even kind of fight a little bit with each other in a certain way, I have literally no trouble visualizing it. But I think it will irritate some people because some people definitely don't like an author to hold their hand. They want to imagine and visualize everything for themselves. And so you might feel like she's told you a little bit too much information, if that makes sense. You very well may feel like she's holding your hand through this and she's telling you now they're moving like this and not any other way not any other way that you might imagine and some readers i can definitely see will be irritated by that but i personally really like it i don't think i am as visual a reader as some people are and so sometimes i definitely need a little bit of help with that so i have really enjoyed this i also think the elements of this that are the romeo and juliet retelling are so so, so strong. I love where she has kept to Romeo and Juliet, and I love where she has deviated from it. And I know this is going to be compared a lot to um, Libba Bray's Diviner series, just because they're both set in the 1920s with some flappers. But I do think they're very similar, and they're very easy comps for each other, because in the Diviners, the Diviners is set in New York City in the 1920s. New York as a city has a very visceral personality. The history of New York very much informs the diviners. The history of America as a whole, its diverse history, its hard history, really informs the diviners, informs the plot, and really gives New York a gritty and dark and historic vibe that it often doesn't have in other books set there. And that is exactly what Chloe Gong has done to me with Shanghai. She has given Shanghai its own personality. Shanghai as a city is its own character in this narrative and I find that absolutely fascinating. I've learned so much from this book about the history of Shanghai and I'm now absolutely fascinated by it. There were some things I felt like I knew. Like I felt like I knew there was a strong English presence in Shanghai but I never knew there was a French presence there um, and I never knew really too much about how communism started to grow in China and in Shanghai in particular and this book is really dealing with that. There is a physical monster that is you know driving people to uh, kill themselves in this narrative and that's the large mystery portion of it is how are they going to defeat this monster and getting together with your enemy, teaming up with your enemy to figure out what's going on. But the real monster in this narrative is imperialism, is colonialism. Uh, and it is just genuinely fascinating. It is a fantastic read. So far, I highly recommend this. If you've been on the fence about it, definitely give it a try. This has really flipped Romeo and Juliet on its head and done some really interesting things with it. But you see which characters are going to fulfill which roles in the play. And so you kind of, in a way, feel like you know where this is going based on the fact that you know Romeo and Juliet, but you absolutely do not know where the monster storyline, the monster plot is going, this mystery element. So while this is a really great retelling and it's keeping a lot of the elements that makes Romeo and Juliet successful and identifiable as a retelling, it's also doing a lot of fresh new things. And so it's keeping readers who are maybe very, very familiar with Romeo and Juliet, it's keeping you on your toes as well. Uh, and so I just am really enjoying this. Uh, so that has been my reading for the week. I was would love to hear how your reading week has gone. If you're in the U.S., I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, and if you are in the rest of the world, I hope you had a great Thursday. <laughs> uh, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.